Well, happy Father's Day. It's great to see you today. We're going to look at Luke chapter 15 today. We're going to talk about the story that really is misnamed probably in your Bible. You need to realize that, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they did all the names and all that kind of stuff in your Bible later. But this story we typically call the prodigal son. And it really should be called the prodigal's father. If you really look at the story, the switch for the religious people of the day was that instead of rejecting his son for messing up, the father received his son. Now, I don't know what kind of dad you had, and some of you may have had awful dads, to be honest with you. Uh, some of you, like uh, Jessica, who wrote me uh, between services to let me know Happy Father's Day. Um, she didn't have a dad growing up. Just a mom, and uh, so that's why I went to her synchronized swimming stuff. And uh, uh, it wasn't really on my list. Like, go to synchronized swimming. No, you do that because you know somebody, right? Um, anyway, sorry. Did <laughs> I just say that out loud? Um, but, you know, my prayer for you is that even if your dad was not a great dad, maybe even a bad dad or wasn't existent, my prayer is that you saw some people or had some people in your life that were great dads. And here's the thing I know. Even if you had an awesome dad, your dad was not perfect. I know that's a shocker to some of you, but your dad wasn't perfect. And so God brought other people in your lives. I look at my life. I had a man named Mr. Garmin who restored uh, uh, cars. Uh, well, actually, he restored Mustangs that were built between 1965 and 68. Yeah, and uh, he used to buy them for $800 and then sell them for a few thousand. Those cars today are worth, some of them, I think, go for $60,000. Dollars, just so you know, but he, you know, he used to work, and I and I learned how you could work and something go wrong, and you didn't have to get angry and throw stuff or blow stuff up or yell cuss words, and well, I mean, you know, I needed that. I needed to know that you know you can do that. And then uh, 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 one of my teachers, Mr. Green, um, he uh, was also the dean of the school, and um, I shouldn't have graduated, but that's another story for another day. Uh, he actually had that talk with me that the board had said. We don't want Eric to walk in graduation, but Mr. Green said, no, he's walking. And uh, so anyway, um, I probably shouldn't tell that story because he's working at the school again. And they might fire him. But um, so, but he, uh, he showed me an example of what it was like to be able to discipline and to, and without getting angry. Um, you know, just to be able to discipline in life. And then Lynn Trivett, who lives in Titusville, who I lived with uh, off and on for a while and has been a dad to me for years and years, uh, who he didn't have kids of his own, but I've watched him over the years adopt young men, treat his wife in an awesome way, adopt young men and help them to find their way in life, men who were kicked out of their house or young, young men who were uh, uh, having a bad start and he was able to help them, he and his wife were able to help them. And to help them grow. And then uh, uh, Dave Daniel, uh, who passed away a few years ago, is one of my mentors. He taught me a lot spiritually, especially about grace and how much God loves us and how it's easy to slip into workspace religion and slip away from really understanding God's grace for us and how much he loves us even on our worst day. And then he also taught me that uh, how to think linearly. I don't think linearly. If you're, if you're like me and you're ADD, you tend to think A, B, C, F, K, J, Z. Right, and so they teach you how to, you know, kind of taught me how to do that and charts. And then uh, Rudy Moberg taught me that it was okay to pray, and it's okay as a man to pray and to be honest and vulnerable. Rudy's very a vulnerable per person, probably the first person I met uh, that was super vulnerable. And then Harold Brantley, who taught me that you can uh, care for somebody even if they don't agree with you. This is how I met Harold. I was twenty something years old. I was on the staff at my very first church. Had no idea what I was doing. Harold came and preached a message. And the message he preached talked about some things that I didn't like. So I went up to him. I said, Harold, I just want you to know. This is my introduction to him. Harold, I want you to know. I really like you. But I do not like your sermon. Which, I don't know, for you, a 20-something-year-old punk said that to me. I'd probably look at him and say, well, too bad. You don't know what you're talking about. But he said, oh, it sounds good, Eric. Let's, uh, let's go to lunch this week. And I can't quite do a Texas accent, but that was my closest. And uh, so we went to lunch. We became friends. He taught me how to play golf. I have spent hundreds, probably in the thousands of hours with Harold Brantley over the years, and he's taught me so much about so many things. So my prayer for you is, regardless of what your home life was like or your parents were like, that not only, not only did God bring other people in your life that I pray you'll be thankful for, that you'll realize that man or woman, there are people today looking up to you. And if you go out of your way to be a blessing to people just like me today, you might get a text one day that just says, thank you so much for pouring into my life. 
Now, here's a few facts every man should know. And ladies, this might help you too. Number one, it's okay to have emotions, as you discovered earlier in the service, and to be yourself. Guys, it's okay just to be you. You don't have to be like everybody else. Some of you like chopping down trees. Some of you have never had a blister. It's okay. We still like you. It's okay. It doesn't make you a wimp. Well, maybe, but you know, we're not going to put you We're still going to love you, even if you're a wimp. Number two, you need relationships with other men. And ladies, I want to encourage you. I'm not saying to let your man, you know, not let. I know you don't let. But I'm not saying you to encourage your man to get out of the house every night and go drinking with his buddies. That's not what we're talking about here. But you also need to, if he's saying, hey, I want to spend some time with so-and-so. Listen, it's good for them to have men who can come alongside them and, and share just life sometimes, okay? Number three, guys, you struggle with balance. Ladies, I know you struggle with balance. We all struggle with balance. Everybody struggles with balance. You know, you, you start getting in shape or you, or you struggle with food or you don't get in shape. You know, my goal is to go from pumpkin to pear. <laughs> my brother likes to tell people he has the body of a god, Buddha. <laughs> Number four, you have to take care of your body and mind. And here's what I figured out. I want you to watch, okay? I'm going to give you this as an illustration, okay? All right, I'm moving across the stage, right? And my body is moving across the stage. And if you notice, my mind is also moving across the stage. If you don't take care of one or the other, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle. And sleep, by the way, is part of that, just so you know, which I haven't had enough of. Number five. Oh, guys. If I could just somehow pour this into my manly friends, you cannot control other people. But you can bless them. And Jesus actually said, bless your enemies. And that's for you, not for them. Because here's the deal. Sometimes when you bless your enemy, and that doesn't even mean you need to let them know. There may be somebody at work that you just don't like, and it, the best thing for you to do might be to buy a $5 Starbucks gift certificate and leave it on their desk without them knowing. Just so you know that you went out of your way to bless a doofus. And there's something about that, but you can't control other people. So there's times where you need to say what my secretary says to me all the time, not my circus, not my monkeys. And you just need to realize sometimes, hey, it's not your circus. Quit trying to tell everybody else that you need to control them, all right? Number next, spending time with God will make you a better man. Habits of a good father and a good man. Now, now men are very different from women. I'm going to tell you how with a very simple story about my dad. My dad, uh, my brother, when he was like 16, 17, bought a big truck. One of those trucks you have to have a ladder to climb in. But my older brother's a lot taller. Actually, my younger brother. Everybody's taller than me. Okay, we'll just say that. So my older brother's about 6'3", and uh, my younger brother's 6'1", and I'm 5-something. Anyway, so, um, and my brother, by the way, my younger brother points that out to me every time I talk to him. So, um, but I always just tell him I'm a better pastor than he is, so it works out. All right, so, anyway, no, I don't really that's a, okay. We're not going to go into sibling rivalry now. Anyway, so, so, we go, so my dad decides that we can take our two-wheel drive Chevy truck out to the Everglades and try it out. So he says to us, boys, we're about 10 years old. He says, boys, you want to go mudding? Mudding? If you don't know what mudding is, then get a dictionary. Anyway, so we want to go mudding. And so we went out to the Everglades. Now, you got to realize in the Everglades at this time, Cessnas would fly over and drop cocaine, and drug dealers would go out there to get it. So it wasn't always really safe. I mean, you would think, like, you probably think, oh, it's not safe because of the animals. No, no, it's not safe because of the animals who are distributing cocaine to people. Anyway, so, so we go out to the Everglades. We get out there. Oh, my gosh, it was awesome. He hits the mud, and it is spinning. It's 50, well, not 50 feet. It's 20 or 30 feet in the air, and then it spins behind us. And then, I mean, we're just, he's just gunning it. We're, and we got so much farther than I ever thought. We, we were about 300 yards from the road when all of a sudden, I mean, buried the whole rear end of the truck, just buried it. And there is nobody out there. And it is getting dark. So now, this is where dads and moms differ. Like until that point, you're like, I'm a mom. I might. No, you wouldn't think ahead. You wouldn't do that. Okay, but you might. You might. So let's, but here's what he did at this point. He said, just before cell phones. Boys, I'm going to get help. If anybody comes, just get on the floorboard of the truck. That was our safety talk. <laughs> Someone might come to kill you, hide from them. That was what we got. And then he left. For hours. For hours. He left. We're in the Everglades. Right? 
in four feet of mud <laughs> in a truck. If it was a woman, she would have put her children on her back and walked to find help. Well, no, dads go, you know what? It's too much work to take you with me. So, um, <laughs> just, um, you know, maybe he's looking for his chip. You know what? Uh, here's what I'm, in hindsight, here's what I'm thinking might have happened. He was tired of us. We were fighting all the time. <laughs> he thought, we'll just get as far as we can. I'll just walk home. <laughs> Boys, stay right there. Oh, my. <laughs> and then he got a little farther and he thought, I guess we gotta go get him. So eventually, after it got dark, a truck came and was able to pull us out of the... And now, by the way, a tow truck doesn't do that. You have to get a hillbilly and, <laughs> and a big truck to come. And, and they gotta have the tires that are bigger than the mud and come. And a hillbilly came and pulled us out and my dad gave him money and I don't know how much, but it was enough. And... Um, um, he probably asked the guy, you sure you won't just leave him? But he decided to get us. But there's some traits of a good man. I know, i got to go back to the sermon now from that. So, listen, no father is perfect. You might have had an awesome father, but no father is perfect except for God. And in the story we're going to look at today, here's what you need to realize. Instead of anger and wrath, the father in this story had compassion and love and grace. And Jesus was telling the religious leaders a story about God and about them. And they don't like this story, by the way. They love the beginning. They don't like the ending. They're angry by the ending of this story. Jesus is talking about lost things. And their view was, if you don't live up to our rules, you don't make it. And little did they realize that God the Father just waits for you to come home. So number one, what is the traits of a good father? And we're going to look, by the way, man or woman... These are all traits that we have to work on. These are all things that we have to work on, except here's what we also need to realize. You are a child of the king, and he has these traits for you. Number one, he doesn't try to control others. Do you know God doesn't try to control you? In Revelation it says, I stand at the door and knock. Do you realize God can knock down the door? But he knocks. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father... Give me my share of the estate. Oh. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. Time out. By the way, one of the things you might not notice, he gave both sons what they were going to get. Later, the older son complains that he never gave them anything. That's how ungrateful uh, uh, religious people become. Anyway, so... And then, not long after that, he, he squandered his wealth in wild living. I mean, he went on Netflix binges. I mean, it was bad. It was bad. You know, some of you are like, what's a Netflix binge? That's all right. Is that an alcohol? So, you know, okay. After he had spent everything, there was a severe lamin. Hey, lamin? There was a lamin. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and there were no Walmarts. Is that not in your version? And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, listen, who sent him to the field to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. He lost his whole identity. He no longer was acting like a child of this father. He was Jewish. To feed pigs was the worst thing you could do. Now listen, I want to tell you something about guys. If you had a dad that had a lot of these around the house, he probably works on roads, right? I know guys who work on streets and stuff. they got a billion of these. When they get broken, they get to take them home. So they have about 400 in the garage. Let me tell you something about guys. Guys find a lot of who they are in their identity. And so, typically, if you ask a dad or ask a guy, you know, guys are talking, their first question is, hey, so what's your name? My name's whatever. And by the way, sometimes it's so bad that these two questions are reversed. The second question, what do you do? What do you do? Sometimes the first question is, we don't even care about your name. What do you do? That's, I'm, am I, right? If you're a guy, you know that. It's normal. Why? Because we wrap a lot of it in our identity. And here's the deal. So what happens when guys lose their job or they lose their place or something changes in their life that they feel like is their identity? They really struggle. 
because they forget who they are, just like this young man forgot who he was. What's your identity? Your identity really is that you're a child of the king. This father did not try to control his children. You know, if you want to teach a child how to walk, what do you do? You, you, you help them up, you hold their hands, right? And then when they turn 40, you let them go, right? Isn't that how it works? Right? No, no, what do you do? You help them to get started, and then they fall, right? And you might help them up a few times, but then eventually, what do you got to do? You got to let them get themselves up. You got to back up and go, got to get yourself up, because if you don't, they never learn. This father understood this. You've got to let people fall. You've got to let them fail. You've got to let them reap the consequences of their behavior. You've got to let them learn. Because if you always rescue them, they will not learn. You've got to let them struggle. You've got to let them mess up. You've got to let them do the wrong thing. And then they have to figure out, am I going to do the right thing? Do you realize God gives other people grace? He knows that he doesn't have to control everything. Number two, this father created a safe environment with consequences. See this cone? Some of your dads should have carried ten of these around them because they were not safe. Some of you had fathers who you couldn't say anything to. You were criticized and belittled and put down. You couldn't mention your life. You couldn't talk to them about anything. They would make you feel lower than low. God's not that way. How do I know? Because listen. When he came to his senses, this is talking about the son, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? It was such a safe place that even the people that were below children, who at that time served and usually weren't given any extra, had more than enough. And he thought, that's a safe place. And here I am, starving to death. I'll set out, I'll go back to my father, and then he writes his speech. Father... I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And then it continues. Make me like one of your hired servants. He thought, it's better to be a servant than be out here. I've had enough pig slop. I'm working. I'm, I'm in unclean. So he got up and he went to his father. The son knew it was a safe place, but he also knew that there were boundaries. He knew he'd have to repent. He knew he couldn't just go home and go, well, I'm back. He knew he'd have to say what I've done is wrong. Are you a safe place? Are you a, a person that when somebody comes to you, they can talk to you about anything and they feel loved and accepted, even if you have to give them advice? Or do you try to fix everybody? Or do you respond in anger and criticism and bitterness? As you do that, you just put cones around yourself. If you've noticed if people don't come and ask you questions, it's probably not because they don't have questions. Because when you respond improperly and when you use anger and criticism and critique and put-downs and sarcasm, people start seeing the cones. This son looked at his dad and he saw no cones. He saw boundaries, but he didn't see cones. He knew it was a safe place. He wanted to go home. Number three, his father demonstrated emotion and compassion, which at this time was seen as undignified. The religious leaders... This is the point in the story where they lost their minds. You can hear them go, oh, God. Because they were hoping that if this child came home, that the dad would let him have it. Because that's what they did. If people didn't follow their rules exactly the right way, or they blew it, or they messed up, they said, you are out. Because their religion became a club. Listen, can I tell you something? If we're not careful as a church, we'll become a club. We're not a club. If we're going to be a club, let's just make us the YMCA and get gym equipment and Pay fees, cover charge at the door, right? We're not a club. It's not about you. So we got to go out of our way to be unselfish and sacrificial because it's not about us. But there's a tendency in religious circles to start to think this is mine and mine and get away. And, and that's what the religious leaders began to do. Listen to what happened. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with anger, disappointment. No. That's how you guys may feel God feels about you, but he doesn't. When he looks at you, on your worst day, this is how God looks at you. 
on the worst day where you've done and said the dumbest thing you've ever said or done. I'm still raising the bar on that for me. I, every day I'm like, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever done. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. You know what that means? That means the father was standing on the porch. He didn't go and rescue his son. He let his son fail. He let him mess up. But as soon as he saw that his son was repentant and starting to make things right and start to work on things, he ran at him. Now, he never ran early. He didn't go and pull him out of the pig slop. He knew he needed to fail and fall and get to the point where he said, I repent. He threw his arms around him. He kissed him. I love this. The son said to the father, I've sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And if you'll notice, he doesn't get to finish his speech. The father interrupts him. I don't need your speech. I'm glad you're repentant. Let's move on. Now let me ask you this question. How do you greet people in your house? When somebody comes home, do you even recognize them? Do you even say Hi. Are you looking down at your phone and you, ah, ah. listen, unless you live in a mansion, I'm guessing that your front door is not 100 yards from your back door. If it is, will you give me a call? I want to come visit. And yet we don't take, we, we are talking to people a thousand miles away who don't care about us and ignoring people that are in our homes that care about us. Greet people when they come to your house. <laughs> Welcome them. Put your phone down. At the very least, say, hey, good to have you home. How was your day? And then when people leave, do you recognize them leaving? Everybody, everybody wants a man named Jed to say goodbye to them. They want Granny waving as they leave. You know, we watch the Beverly Hills, and that's what we like. Every time we watch the show, they say goodbye. Did you notice that? Every time they walk through the door. When's the last time you walked somebody out and said, have a great day? Or was it more like, leave me alone? God, your heavenly Father, never says, leave you alone. Leave me alone. The Pharisees expected rejection. They expected him to have to earn his way back, but Jesus twisted the story. They hate this story. Number four. He forgives and accepts us when we're broken. By the way, you might be visiting today, so I just want to show you this. We know it, but we want you to know it. How many of you are broken? So if you're visiting today and you're perfect, there's a great church down the street where perfect people all gather. But the father said to his servants, he interrupts the son in the middle of the speech, quick. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. By the way, at that time, a ring was like a credit card. You now have the family credit card. You can go to any store and go, hey, I'm part of the family. If you're Italian, I'm part of the family. <laughs> I always make it. I'm sorry. If you're Italian, please don't be mad at me later. <laughs> we won't be mad. We'll just give you. <laughs> put a ring on his finger. Listen to this. Sandals on his feet. Let me tell you what that's about. Servants did not have shoes. Servants were barefoot. So the dad was saying to him, you don't have to be a slave anymore. Here's some shoes. By the way, the reason they didn't have shoes is so they couldn't run away. Hard to run away in a desert culture with no shoes. And then he said this, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Today we'll do that with bacon. It doesn't seem right, but there it is. <laughs> Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This is exactly what God does anytime somebody comes home to him. This is the reason why as a church, one of our main, our main purpose statements says to help people find their way home to Christ. Because we understand church isn't about us. It's about helping other people to find their way home. We're already home. If you're a Christian, you've already found your way home. Congratulations. But it's not about keeping the doors locked and saying, this is my house. Don't get it dirty. It's about saying, come on in. I mean, we even really have coffee and sausage. What do we have? Sausage and gravy today. Some of you have been disowned by people in your life because you messed up and blew it. And you think God's that way. God's not that way. And as Christians, we shouldn't be that way. 
If somebody blows it and messes up and repents, we should be the first ones to say we forgive you. Christians should be the most gracious, merciful, forgiving people on earth. You want to pack this church out? Do those three things. And that doesn't mean to just let people do whatever they want. No rules, just right. You know, the Outback. By the way, you think Outback Statehouse is no rules, just right? Today, go to lunch and say, I'm just going to sit down. You guys don't seat me. There's no rules, right? I'm just going to take that chair in front of these hundred other people. You'll find out. There's rules. And you're not right. God always forgives when there's true repentance. Always. He doesn't even let you finish your prayer. He's already forgiven you. That's what happens with the Father in this story. And number five, God sees you as worthy, valuable, and important. See, if you're religious, you think that you're valuable to God because of what you do. Because of your job. And especially if you're a guy because you've grown up thinking your job is, you know, your name and your job. That's you. No. No. God loves you not because of what you do. He loves you because of who you are. And when you surrender to Jesus Christ, he says, welcome home. He doesn't say, get this right, and then I'll welcome you home. He says, hey, come home, and then we'll clean you up. He puts a robe on him before his bath. Did you notice that? Messed up a good robe. But that's what God does. He brings us home first, and then he cleans us up. We try to clean people up so we can bring them to church. That'd be like trying to get skinny before you go to the gym. Somebody was like, there's hypocrites in church. I'm like, there's fat people in the gym. <laughs> that wasn't in my notes. I just enjoyed that. <laughs> so what happens? Jesus now is talking to these religious leaders because the older brother is the religious leaders. They were ones that thought they had it together. They rejected people who didn't have it together. And here's what he says. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. His father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered, Father, look, all these years, I love this, I've been slaving for you. They had slaves. This was slaving for him. Yes, would you get my shoes, please? Yes. Listen, we got the field to clean. Could you guys go out and glean the field? Yes, yes, I'll be here. Slaving away. <laughs> While his brother was actually a slave. But he didn't care because he did what was right. I've never disobeyed your orders and you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. By the way, he probably had goat every night. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes. By the way, it never says in the story that he actually did that. The brother was really ticked so he just said whatever. Comes home, you killed the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Something burning. We set the fire alarm off in here. It's going to be a really short service. Maybe that was the plan. My son, the father said, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. And if you remember, he divided the wealth already. The son had the wealth. And he said, but we had to, be, we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He's lost and is found. Listen, other religious leaders may have told you that because you don't have your act together, God hates you. He doesn't. They may have told you until you get all fixed up, you can't home, come home to God. No, no. Nay, nay. God loves you right where you're at. He loves you too much to leave you there. He does wait for you to fall. He waits for you to fail. He waits for you. Listen, we all, Paul said this. He said, we all struggle in many ways. We all do dumb things. And the father waits on the porch. And as soon as we start to come home, he runs after you. God knows your worth. And you know why you're worth a lot? Why you're priceless? Because that's what God paid for you. Every religion in the world says you do these things and earn your way to God. You do these things and you earn your way to God. You do these things and you earn your way to God. The Bible says you could do nothing for yourself. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God came to you. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that at the end of the service today. I'll be here after the service. I want to tell you one final thing today. God is your perfect heavenly father. 
He does all the things we've talked about today perfectly. Even if your dad was not a good example, your heavenly father loves you every day. So make every day the father's day. Take time every day to thank, thank God for what he's done for you. To thank him that he loves you even on your dumbest day he loves you. And if you're struggling in one of these areas, my prayer is that you'll begin to say, God, you've given me your Holy Spirit. Help me to become holy. Help me to do what's right. That's what righteousness means, to do what's right. God, help me when I blow it and I mess up and I put cones around myself. Father, to remove those and be a safe place for the people around me. We have some great dads here. We have some moms who act as dads here, too. We have some great people here. But even on your best day, God is so much better. And he's always faithful and loving and cares about you. And he has compassion on you today. We're going to give bacon away in a minute, which is an odd way to end a service. But there it is. I'll be here for prayer. I don't have as much time today, but you can always write me or text me or email me or send smoke signals or whatever way you like to communicate. And then we're going to have a butterfly release a little bit later. That's never happened, but that was good. We're going to have a butterfly release a little bit later in honor of dads who've gone before. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that in this story we see the prodigal son, but you see the father who loves the prodigals. And Father, all of us have strayed, the Bible says. All of us have wandered off, and yet you gather us as your children, and you love us. And Father, when we wander off and we find our own way and we get lost and we get hurt and we fall down and we end up in the pig slop, I thank you that when we repent and we come home, that you receive us and you clean us up and you purify us from all unrighteousness. Father, we love you and we thank you for that. Lord, for that one who doesn't feel worthy today, I pray you'd begin to pour out your love on them. They begin to understand that it's not about what we do, but it's about who we are. We are your children. Father, for that one today who's never become your child, they've never surrendered their life to you, I pray today would be the day that they admit their sin and receive your free gift of salvation. Lord, thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a closing song. We're going to have our time of giving. You just give what God's put on your heart. And uh, this is a great song. There's lots of words in this song. We changed the song last night, but I think this is a perfect song to end our service.